Good morning. I'd like to ask if you would please uh, open your Bibles to Romans again as we continue our study in Romans. We're going to be beginning in chapter 2 this morning. Uh, chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. And we'll be looking at, uh, Lord willing, verses 1 through 11. But before Amen. Uh, we're going to do our scripture reading this morning. That's going to be, uh, we're going to begin in verse 1. Be, uh, we're going to begin in verse 1, chapter 2, Romans, uh, Romans 2, 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things, the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and do the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despise thou the riches of his goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impentant heart treasureth up unto, thy, unto thyself the wrath against the day of wrath, and, and, and the revelation of the righteousness judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patience, continuance, to them who by patience, continuance, and well-doing seek for the glory and honor and immediate and, and, and immortality of uh, an immortality and eternal life. But unto them that are contentious, immortality and eternal life but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness and indignation and wrath tribula tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the jew first and also the gentile but glory honor honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the jew first and also the gentile for there is no respect of persons with God. Father, we just thank you for this, for your word this morning. We ask you to be with us, Father, this morning as we look into it, Father. And Father, you, you have us a little bit more in you, Lord, that we might know you a little better and understand, Father, you, who you are through these, through through, through this, uh, through this, uh, through this part of the, of the scriptures. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name, Amen. You know, last week as we had begin this section, and we're talking about a section that runs through chapter 3, uh, this part of it, but what we want indignation or, or the indictment of God truly against the gross and fragrant and, and, and the openness against ungodliness. But now God is going to turn his attention, uh, or Paul's really going to turn his attention to, uh, being God's word, turn his attention to the respectable sinner who in Romans 1, we go back, Romans 2, and we're looking at verse 1 again, says, says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest dost the same things. As we saw, as we just mentioned, Paul, but now he speaks to those who are generally moral in their conduct and kind of congratulate themselves that they're not like other people as we looked at describing in verse 1. They might even say things such as, yes, you know, Paul's right, what he said about it last week. We know that the heathen, uh, that the heathen are what they get. Okay? But the hypocrite feels that other men's sins are worse than their own. And he sees himself as righteous. In other words, he sees himself literally as being better than others and puts himself above them. It kind of should take us back to what the Lord had to say concerning this, I think. It should take us back to what the Lord had to say concerning this, I think. If we were to uh, go over to uh, Luke 18, if you want to turn there this morning, Luke 18, we're going to look in verse 9. We look at what the Lord had to say in a parable. In this parable in Luke 18, 9. 9. 
It begins in verse 9. He says, And he spake, that's Jesus, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and please notice, and despised others. Two men went down into the temple to pray. Two men went down into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Give tithes to all I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his father's house. I tell you, this man went down to his father's house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Think about this parable just a minute. In this parable we see that both both think about this parable just a minute. In this parable we see that both both men prayed. But both men did not come to God the same way. The Pharisee went to the temple to pray, but he did not pray. He spoke within himself, not with God. He prayed thus with he prayed thus within himself. And in his short prayer, he repeated the word I five times. I five times in that short little prayer. It is entirely possible to address your words to God. But actually, by praying, you're really praying to your, about yourself or to yourself, and it's truly not on God. You know, we come to God sometimes, we go into prayer, and we pray almost like this Pharisee did. It's all about us. It's all about who we are and all the good things and telling God how, how good we are or whatever, instead of focusing upon the, God, upon the Lord. You see, your passion for your, uh, when you see this, your passion is for your agendas, not, not God's. Your attitude, your, your attitude is, my will be done. You're asking God about your will and not that thy will be done. We're not looking to God. The man was full of praise. He rejoiced, but not for who God was. Think about those things just a little bit and how sometimes we may not even realize these things in, in prayers. And we can hear them even in an open prayer like we have in this assembly here this morning. Even from the pulpit, we'll hear prayers that are more about men and about ourselves and about ourselves, rather than about praise, rather than about praising the Lord and understanding that we are to come to our Lord with our request, make known, but we're to come, we're to come humbly, and we're to come with a true open heart and in truth and understanding that He knows what we need better than we do, but it pleases Him to hear our request and the kind of attitude that we should have concerning these things. Him to hear our request and the kind of attitude that we should have concerning these things. Now Paul turns to, the very, to, to those very ones and says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou hast judged the same things. Some have suggested that this, that this apostle, that primarily, uh, Paul is speaking primarily to the Jews. I don't know about you, but I guess I'm more of a, somewhat of a black and white person in this, I think the scripture is pretty clear who he's speaking to. Notice what it says. He says, notice what it says. He says, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. I don't know how hard that is to understand. O man. Well, who's he talking to? All. Isn't he talking to all men? And it's whosoever judges. That's who he's talking to. It's very clear. To get all these things, you have to be careful of getting off on these, on these tracks and things. The term refers, of course, to, to, to any man who judges, it's either, either Jew or Gentile, and it's no matter who he is. This is a man who knows probably right from wrong and has moral discernment. You know, the key word and where we're going to be stated, it appears nine times in these passages. That's in verses as we're talking about in this section, which goes to, to the end of uh, right about mid, mid part of uh, of uh, chapter 3, but he says, that, he begins with, thou art the judge, thou art the, thou, thou art the judges, speaking of ourselves, that we want to judge, thou art, the, thou, thou art the judges, speaking of ourselves, that we want to judge, 
But it, he ends with this in the last one. He says, in that day that God shall judge. The, it, the ending with God, on the, it ends literally with God on the throne, doesn't it? That's where we should see God at all times. With a morally good man is, the very, is very simple and common. He's measuring by a wrong standard. He's measuring himself and looking at others oftentimes and considering himself being better than others based upon who he thinks he is. Looking at his own righteousness and the unrighteousness of what he sees in other people. If one wants to measure themselves by others, there's only one that one should really measure themselves with, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It reminds me of the little thing that you, I used to learn and I have mentioned so many times, it really has helped me. It's like trying to understand all the isms and all the different types of, uh, different types of uh, uh, religions out there and trying to understand each other. One. It doesn't hurt to know a little bit about where other people are coming from with some of their religions, I don't think. I think if you've got time to know some of that, it's good. But how do you know right from wrong? How do you know what is right? Well, you always know what's right just as if you put a straight line. You're in construction now, Pastor. You, if you put a straight line, you're in construction now, Pastor. You do something with a straight line, that's perfectly right. Anything you put against that that doesn't measure up to that isn't straight, isn't it? So what is our straight line? It's the Word of God, isn't it? So if we trusting in the Lord, we have, we're trusting in the Lord and we're looking at it, it's good to have a Bible with us this morning, isn't it? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And there's certainly, don't talk to my wife, but there's certainly not much good about me. So we know that. But we do know that his word is true. And we are to be looking at his word and checking what we're hearing to make sure that what we're hearing matches that what we're hearing matches with the word of God. And it is, and it truly is his word. You see? But when God judges the man, it's not by the standards that they choose. It will be by his own standard. Man wants to say that he can set up his own standard for God. That he can decide how God can judge and what it for God. That he can decide how God can judge and what, what's right and what's wrong. Yes, we want to remember that. You know, the word hypocrite comes from the word which means to be a part of or to put on a show for others. It's just acting out. It's, e it's just acting out. It's easy to be... It's easy to be in, 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 in with it. Oh, let's just put it like this. It's easy to see other people's sins. It's easy to, to judge people on how bad they are in their own area, our own sins. That's, what the, that's the type of person that's talking about here, the self righteous person. And this is essentially what hypocrisy is, or, or, or yeah, what hypocrisy is. Now, in Romans, uh, going to, uh, back to 2, uh, chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth, against, according to the truth against them which commit such things. Truth. Notice that word truth. That should stick out to us. Pastor asked this morning, what stuck, what stuck out in that song with you? I want you to think about that just a minute. According, it says, the judgment according to truth. Judgment, the judgment of God according to truth. What is the truth? Well, Edith already said it. I already answered that question. John 4, 16. Jesus said unto him, or Jesus said unto him, I am the way, and I am... Where is all truth? It is the Word of God. It is Jesus Christ, isn't it? That is the truth. And he goes on to say, I am the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our Lord is truth. He knows all truth. And you know something else? He cannot be deceived, can he? Something else? He cannot be deceived, can he? He can't be deceived. Man can believe what they want. See, to put it in any kind of, uh, any way that they want to believe it. But, that's, but, that, but, but he's not ever deceived. You know, and I want us to understand that we're talking about judgment here. It does not say that we don't know right. The Bible's going to teach us that from his word of God, aren't we? We know what's right. We know what's wrong. We should know these things in the Word of God. You know, in Song 1, I think we can get a pretty good perspective of what kind of a little bit of it here what a right, uh, concerning a righteous man and what he calls the wicked, or we might call the unjust man. If we look at that song, if you want to look at that. 
And we're going to begin in verse 1. It's a very short psalm. And most of us probably know this one. This actually opens up all, the, all of the book of, of Psalms. It's the right place. It's almost like a, uh, gives us the foundation for what all that you're going to be. But it begins with this. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not on the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of, the, the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in season. His leaves also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth, doeth shall, shall prosper. Think about that for just a few moments. Is there any judgment here? That's what the very first verse tells us. Blessed is the man that walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Has he not made a decision there? This individual would have to make a decision. He would have to decide that these are godly or this is an ungodly group or these are not the kind of people I should be around. Is that not a decision? Decision? Is that what they're doing is wrong, is against God, is ungodly? Is he not making those kind of decisions? And he goes on to tell us he's not at, at, at the ungodly, nor standeth in the, way of the sin, in the ways of the sinners, nor is not to be associated with those things, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor those things, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, nor to be you know, a part of the, all of that that goes on. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. What is the law of the Lord? The Word of God, isn't it? It's right back to the Word of God. It's that wonderful truth. And then it talks about what kind of life. It's that wonderful truth. And then it talks about what kind of life. When it talks about that he shall be like a tree planted by the river of water. By the rivers of water. What does that in entail? Strength, doesn't it? A strong tree being fed with pure, the purity of that stream. How beautiful a picture that would be and, and is of, of what we should bring. And if through that, it brings forth in season much fruit. In other words, because it's constantly being fed by that stream, as we should be by the Word of God, it's consistently being fed. And as it's being fed, what's happening? It's giving out this, it's giving out this great strength, and it's, it's, it becomes great in, in, in all that it's doing, and it has basically a testimony, doesn't it? And that testimony can now go forth because it's strong. There's no fear with this tree. It's a strong tree, and, it did the tr and, and what, what happens with it, it leaves either. And whatsoever we see here, he says, he does, he shall prosper. What is the prosperity that we have as children of God? Well, shoot, I'm making two, two million dollars. I've made that in four years. I am something else, and I tell you what, I'm prospering, aren't I? Is that the kind of prosperity? It comes from the service that we have with the Lord. It comes from taking a stand. And it comes from being a child of God and truly following what he says. And then he goes on to say, as we see, then it's just as easily it goes on in verse 4. Now it says, the ungodly are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Oh, that shaft which the wind driveth away. Oh, that, that, that just reminds me of all the time of the double-minded man, doesn't it you? Just make you realize a double-minded man is what? unstable in all of his ways, isn't he? That's what it's talking about here. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. God knows. He's not deceived. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You know, verse 6 presents, presents the key understanding of this, of this psalm. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the, of the ungodly shall perish. In this psalm, the way of the righteous and the way of the ungodly are contrasted, aren't they? We can see that difference. Now going back to Romans, and we look at verse 3 now. This, O man, that judges them which do such things and doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? How foolish to think that one can deceive the Lord and think that he shall escape the judgment of God. The issue here is primarily not that the, the, the issue the issue here is primarily 
not that the issue here is primarily that they are simply not trusting the Lord. They're not trusting in God. Their trust is in themselves, their own reasoning, their own idea of what judgment should be, their own idea of their own righteousness. Not seeing it from God. Just remember what the Word of God told us. We just saw it, and we'll we try to hope we get there this morning, but, but it, God is no respecter of persons. In Romans, uh, as it tells us in verse 11, it says, for there is no respect of persons with God. It doesn't make any difference. You can be poor, you can be rich. You can be anybody, you can be anybody, no matter what you are. God is going to work with us on an individual basis and realize he made you who you are today. He, he knew who your parents were going to be. He knew all the situations in your life. He knew all the challenges that we were going to face. He knew who you were going to marry. He knew what you were going to do right. He knew what you were going to do wrong. Even face. He knew who you were going to marry. He knew what you were going to do right. He knew what you were going to do wrong even before the world was. And yet he put you where he did today. Goes on in verse 4 to say, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Do you see something here? There's a purpose in all of this, isn't there? It's to lead us to repentance. That what he's talking about. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself, uh, presumes upon the goodness, the forbearance, and long suffering of God, which should bring the moralist into a humble repentance. But instead, what it really ends up doing for many is it actually causes them to think of themselves and they get an attitude of actually more superiority. Some of these things, look at the word, if we look at the word goodness, I took this, what the commentaries had to say. He said, it may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to our past sins. He has been good to us, hasn't he? Because he has not judged us yet, though we actually deserve it, don't we? He doesn't always judge us immediately. He doesn't always judge us immediately. We look at the word forbearance, may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to our present sin. We look at the word forbearance, we may be considered, who may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to our present sin. This very day, indeed, holds back his judgment against us. For those that may just, just come in, we're in, uh, we're in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Okay, the long suffering may be considered God's kindness to us in regard to our future sin. Considering all this, it's no surprise that Paul describes these three aspects. All this, it's no surprise that Paul describes these three aspects of God's kindness to us as riches. Are they not riches? If they can lead us to repentance, are they not? You see, the riches of God's mercy may be measured by four considerations. We see it in his greatness. You know, if you wrong, we see it in his greatness. You know, if you wrong a man, that's a wrong thing to do, isn't it? Someone that's been generous and kind and good to you and given you a lot, and if you wrong that person, if you did things against that person, would that not be the wrong thing? That'd be a very serious thing, you think. But think about it. How much greater is it when we do that to God, you think? But think about it. How much greater is it when we do that to God himself? When men do that to God himself. Yes, this is, this is true. And then there's his omnipotence. Uh, his, his omnipotence. If someone knew all of our sins, remember God, if someone knew all of our sins, remember God knows the very thoughts, the very hairs up on your head. He knows all that there's to know about you, right? Boy, if, I, if you knew all there was to know about me, you wouldn't want to be around me at all. You could really say, whoa, I don't want that to be around that guy. How, how horrible to think. But we really mercy if we knew all that we really was probably know about all them? We may not. We may not even come close. Yet God shows great mercy, doesn't he? In spite of all of that. And then there's his power. You know, there's so much in our lives that we really can't do. In and, our, in and of ourselves is really no real power. Uh, uh, Charles, would you get the door in the back? Thank you. Uh, but anyway, uh, we think about that, the power, the power that it, it, the infinite power that he has, but the infinite power of just understanding us and forgiving us for all the wrongs that we have done and willing to forgive 
in forgiving us for all the wrongs that we have done and willing to forgive us no matter how what we think we, we have done. Because all of these things God, God can do, for he is truly rich in mercy. And then there's knowing the great kind, God's kindness. You know, it's a great sin to, to presume upon the graciousness of God, isn't upon the graciousness of God, isn't it? And how often that can happen. We can easily come to believe that we deserve it. Notice that we deserve all the good things that are happening to us. And we're, we're happy that God doesn't come and we don't see any real judgment there. We just take for granted his mercy and his long suffering. In heaven, let him strike me dead. And when it doesn't happen, they will say, see, I told you, there's no God. You know, men just simply mis misinterpret God's forbearance and long suffering as his approval and their refusal to repent. Instead of seeing his mercy and his grace and his goodness and, leading the, and letting that re lead them to re repentance, they in turn see it as justification for what they do. Let us understand that God's divine patience and love is not weakness. You know, there's a lot of things we can look at in Scripture to see this. When we look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and some of the things in the Old Testament with God, but let us just think for one moment about Calvary itself. Consider this great thousand years ago, Jews and the Gentiles joined together at Calvary in the crucifixion of the Son of God. It was an act that cried for the unleashing of the armies of God and the outpouring of His raft, didn't it? How point of His raft, didn't it? How horrible, how God should have judged right then the horror of what all had gone on there. And now, for some 2,000 years, because of the riches of God's goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, God's goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, He has held up His righteous retribution. He has given time for us Think if he hadn't done that, where would you be today? I, we wouldn't even be here, would we? But there's been this time and I'll be here, would we? But there's been this time and opportunity. The goodness of God is this. It should lead men to repentance. These things that God is so gracious about, these things that we learn are sin, these things are sin, these things that men may think that they get away with, they need to understand that God is being merciful to them at this point in time to give them the time and to look at those things and to see how merciful God is and it should lead them to, re to, to repentance. Yet men, oh, they deserve these wonderful things. God should just be good for them and approve of all that they do. That's because God doesn't exact immediate judgment. Men imagine, and men, and as men, men imagine, men imagine, and men, and as men, men imagine, and He never will. They pursue them. They persuade themselves He has nothing to avenge. That's the way they see it. See, many people misunderstand the goodness of God toward the wicked, but they but they should not see the goodness of God and. Men should see the goodness of God and understand God has been better to them than they certainly deserve. Hadn't he been to you and me? God has shown them kindness when they've ignored him. God has shown them kindness when they have mocked him and to surrender to him and come to him and be saved. God is perfectly willing to forgive them if they will and God should be served out of simple gratitude. Are you waiting for God to drive you to repentance? Notice, my dear friends, that the Lord does not drive you to repentance. Cain, friends, that the Lord does not drive you to repentance. Cain was driven away as a fugitive and a vagabond when he killed his righteous brother Abel. Judas went and hanged himself, being driven by the anguish of remorse because of what he had done in betraying the Lord. 
because of what he had done in betraying the Lord. But the sweetest and best repentance is that which comes from, not by driving, but by drawing, being drawn away. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, and that's where we should be. Now in verse 6 it goes on, Render to every man according to his deed. On the judgment day, on the day of judgment, God will weigh every thought, every word, and every deed. The sins of omission as well as sins of commission, the effect of each sin will be considered in all its aspects. In effect, upon the sinner himself, on others, and most of all, upon God. All this will be weighed, and God will render every man according to his deed. Now verse 7, to them who by patient, who them who by patient continually, who continue in will, patient, who them who by patient continually, who continue in will, to them who by patient continue in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. For those who have the true principles of the grace implanted in them, who have the true principles of the grace implanted in them, whether Jew or Gentile, who are truly seeking, who are truly seeking for glory, as we just mentioned, the glory is being spoken of here, is not the glory of the world, not that of that we receive from men, but the glory of God to be glorious within and without, but by grace and righteousness of Christ and to enjoy eternal glory with him hereafter. Honor, honors, honor, not that which Adam had in innocence and did not abide in, but that which is, but that which is and abides with Christ and which all the saints have and shall have. So where do we get these things from? We get them through, through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? It is in him that we can walk. The immortality that we receive is not the immortality of the soul, which immortality of the soul, which is common to all. Remember, there is a heaven and there is a hell, isn't there? You, the people think that if, it, if some think that, well, if I die, it's all over with. It's not. There's going to be a real choice. There's going to be one or two places people are going to go. There's no in the middle. It, it's one or two. So that never fadeth and the inheritance of the saints in that great light as we learn from the word of God as we will continue our study of the book of Romans. We'll see more of those things. The manner in which these things are sought is by patience, continuous and well-doing and by doing good works and by doing those good works from the principle of faith and love and with a view of the glory of God. Now, we want to realize that as we're talking here, we're talking about two different things. We're talking, about, well, we're talking about one thing. We're talking about judgment this morning, aren't we? Are we talking about judgment? Isn't that the key word that we talked about starting off? Judgment. It's important to understand. There's a difference in judgment. It's important to understand. There's a difference in that. There's a difference in judgment. And there's a difference in repentance. I mean, I mean there, there, there's a difference in that. The difference between that. Judgment has to do with what? But, but with sin. We're going to look at that a little bit here in just a minute. Let me wait till we get there. So we see that. As children, wait till we get there. So we see that. As children of God, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we grow in Christ, in wisdom, and in knowledge, and in truth. The seeking and seeking the Lord, the Lord's leading by doing, the, doing naturally the, the, that, the, what is righteous in the sight of God. And last of all, we see that in the, the eternal life, which he, through his rich through his rich grace, has promised them before the world was. Through Christ was the pure gift of grace, and he bestowed on all that received him as their Lord and Savior. Now look at verses, verse 8 with me, if you would please here this morning. But now look at verses, verse 8 with me, if you would please here this morning. But, un, but unto them, <coughs> but, un, <coughs> but unto them that are contentious, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. 
Some have said this is one of the more, more difficult areas of Rome, Romans. On the surface, it seems to teach salvation by works. Of course, we know this is not the case. How, do we, how are we saved? By grace, right, by grace. By grace you are saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of yourselves, right? Is that not true? That's, it's a gift of God, not of yourselves, right? Is that not true? That's how we're saved. To resolve this difficulty, we must bear in mind that this passage has to do, has to do with, God, with, with God's, uh, with, God's uh, with, with judgment. With, has, has, has to do with judgment, as we just mentioned. According to our works. But salvation is always by faith isn't it? So we don't want to get these two mixed up. Thus seeking for the glory, honor, and incorruption and, incorruption, and eternal life and well-doing is the outcome of faith. Works are the evidence, not the ground. Works are the evidence, not the grounds of salvation. At this point in the epistle, Paul is not discussing how a person is saved. That will come later in our study. Here the point is that Jews and Gentiles are on the same ground in this matter of sin. It's important that we keep these things in mind and really look at what we're talking about here this morning. When we look at these different things that God is bringing out and the challenges that they are, we serve a God that is, that is long-suffering and merciful. And there's been given much time. Many can become quite self-righteous and think, well, I don't do this and I don't do that. And these do this, and that, and that, those do that, and the seriousness of that sin in, in and of itself. The right way to be, we look at our Lord and Jesus, we look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we see how He walked in the world. It was in His day. We can look at the challenges that we're facing today as well, and be quite concerned about everything around us, can't we? But you know, in Jesus' day, it was the same. We spoke about that, I think, last week or the week before, about how rampant a homosexuality was, and all that core about how rampant a homosexuality was, and all that kind of thing going on in the time of Jesus and the time of Paul. We don't see them outwardly going out and trying to fix the government. What we see them is seeking how to bring the message of salvation on an, on an individual basis to individuals of eternal life. Recognizing that as a person comes to the Lord, a revival comes, that revival can be strong enough to change the hearts. And when the hearts are changed, then things will change. But I think we know today from the Word of God that what's going to be, what's going to happen, don't we? We know that God has a plan, and His plan is going to be exactly as He has talked about. But He's a merciful and long-suffering God but we also know that we're probably, we're certainly a day closer. We're coming closer and closer to the probably the very end, whether it be by just simple. Certainly a day closer. We're coming closer and closer to the probably the very end, whether it be by just simple death, we go like that to be with the Lord, or whether we be raptured out of here, one of the two. But we need to understand that in our lives, we need to be on. We, we, we need to keep the real folk, true center on what the truth is of all, and that is Jesus Christ, and know that all things are truly in his hand. And understand that we're not to judge others. God's going to do the judging, but we are to simply teach truth and let God help us in that area. Now, we've got us in that area. Now, we've got some time here this morning. I'd like to ask for, uh, if anybody has a comment or a question this morning like to say anything yes sir well we can look at that just from if what yeah, and that's a very good point we've talked about that too the word of god is a very good point we've talked about that too the word of god itself if you were truly just being rational let's just say someone want to say they're just well i am a man of science i i i, I you have to show me to for me to believe well look at the word of god Look at how many prophecies there are in the Word of God, especially in that order, but in the context of the Bible, at least 25 to 35 percent of it is prophecy. And over half of those have been fulfilled, and they weren't fulfilled in a vague sense, they were fulfilled in an exact sense. What are the possibilities of that? 
he didn't let me use this illustration, so when I research on that, and he figured out that if you took just nine of those, just nine of those prophecies concerning the, uh, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what were the odds are of them being exactly fulfilled as the Bible had said, he said the, the, the probability after this was back in like the 50s or 60s, if you took a silver dollar, which most of us don't know what those are today, but they used to have silver dollars, and, uh, but anyway, they, if, you, if you took one of those and you, you took the state of Texas, and that's not a little state, that's a big state, and you covered it about two and a half feet, and you marked a little red X on one and stuck it in there, in there and took a man and blindfolded him and asked him to reach and find that exact coin, that's what the chances are of just nine of those coming, eight or nine of those coming true. Well, there was over 34 to 50 of those concerning the crucifixion, and there's about there's over three to four hundred that we can look at if we really want to go into it. So the, the, there's over three to four hundred that we can look at if we really want to go into it. So the, the probabilities are just phenomenal. And the Word of God is always right, isn't it? So it's always right. Whatever it says is right. And science finally catches up. Like we talked about even when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, evolution. It's been disproven now. But they still teach it. They want to believe the lie, don't they? The first thing you read in the Bible, they want to convince children right there that this is wrong. And yet we know that it's not. So, my friends, we need to understand just what the pastor said. We know that God is always what the pastor said. We know that God is always right. We don't always understand the whys and the wherefores. But sometimes there can be immediate, but we talk about immediate answer to prayer. When you pray and you ask the Lord and you say, Lord, help me with this and that, and it may require an immediate answer, maybe even an immediate judgment to get your attention, get your attention. And you say, oh, okay, Lord, I got it. it just as he did with Israel. How long suffering was he? Look at what happened with Babylon. They were told and told and told. I mean, Isaiah was going on and on for many, many years before that, telling them what was going to come to pass if they didn't turn around and straighten up, gave them every opportunity in the world. And what happened? They just took it as something more. <coughs> they disbelieved and went in with their, own, with their own idea of what they could do and how to fix the problem instead of simply repenting and coming to the Lord. And what happened? Exactly what God said was going to happen, repenting and coming to the Lord. And what happened? Exactly what God said was going to happen. An exact time that he said it was going to happen. How long did he say it was going to be? Their captivity? 70 years. Pretty specific, isn't it? 70 years. What did he tell Abraham concerning Isaiah, uh, uh, Egypt? How long was that going to be? Was their captivity going to be? 400 years, wasn't it? We can look at so many things in the Bible that prove that the Bible is the Bible, and it's true, but they refuse it. Well, we're about out of time. Anybody else got a quick thing? This very day, he knows. Yeah, that's right. He knew who was going to be here today. He knew every challenge that we were going to face. He knows every challenge going on each and every day. He knows the very challenge that the world is in right now today too, doesn't he? And we can look in history and see the world has not been a very...